this is harder than it looks. Even though I've done quite a bit of cleanup back here, there are still remnants of the years and years of piled up crud. I mean, these piles get like knee high out here and not knee high to a grasshopper either. Well, that's certainly better. If it were just dry leaves, I wouldn't mind so much, but back here, it was layers of wet stuff that would not blow away. I've been making some improvements to the random land jungle over here, but I realized and before I plant anything else, there really needs to be a pathway to clean out future refuse. I've actually got some very exciting news and some cool stuff to tell you guys about today. But first, the chores. Now that I've got most of this cleaned out, I gotta make sure there's a path behind the random land jungle over here. And then I don't know if you can tell, but this is all actually kind of built up on a little dirt hill. So I gotta plant those taller things up on the hill. It was like that when I got here, really. Shouldn't take too long to do, but it's a pain in the butt because there's so many roots in the way from all the existing plants. And then the next part of my plan now is to actually build up that hill little by little with extra soil. One of the weird things that I learned growing up right next to Disneyland is, but Disney will take these Bird of Paradise type plants and they will plant them in the pot, cutting out parts of the bottom for drainage and whatever, because when these are compressed side to side, these Bird of Paradise, whether the white one or the orange one, they will grow taller. And they'll grow for years and years like that. And they also have the benefit of, in Disney's case, if one like gets a little wonky looking, they can just remove it, take it back to the nursery. Or if I move to a different house, theoretically I could dig it back up. See, look at that. You leave a little space for the roots, but you leave just enough plastic to hold up the plant if you were gonna lift down the bulk of it. Pretty good. At this point, it's almost too dark to keep going. It took all day and it's looking a little ripped up, but it's all coming together. By the way, these right here are solar flicker, come on, flicker torches. If they're in the sunlight at all during the day, they will flicker all night, every night. Mine are in shade, so they do pretty good. These were recommended to me by my friend Spike from the Hula Girls. And as you'll see in a minute, they look pretty darn cool. Really quick though, in the last bit of the light here, I wanna add some of that extra soil from some of these bags I was talking about. Hold on one second. All right, that's the soil right here. And then I'm just gonna take it back. I soiled myself. Dude, I didn't know this video was gonna be so dirty, wow. Jeez, and last but not least, the cleanup before it gets too dark. Okay, everything's a little bit wonky, but it's somewhat reset up. Let me just uh, wait until the sun goes all the way down and then feast your eyes on this. Now someday, instead of these solar spotlights, which go out rather quickly, and instead of the Christmas lights, I'll have some wired lights back there that are blue and green in the bushes, Disneyland style with a little bit of spotlights on the actual tiki's themselves. But for now, this looks pretty darn good, I gotta say. It looks pretty good. It's no adventure land, but speaking of, it just makes me think how hard the gardeners have to work at places like that, planting this stuff out, setting it up, taking care of it. This took me all day and I'm still not finished. The idea is those big bird of paradise will get tall, they'll thicken out, and eventually help to screen off that cinder block back there. Although I may help it with some bamboo fencing or something like that in the future. And then of course there won't be the Christmas light jumble down there, you know, it'll be better stuff. Little spotlights like this, but wired. It'll be blue and green and you know, very Adventureland at night-esque. Yeah, I gotta say though, these little flame tiki torch things that Spike told me to buy on Amazon are the best. Anyway, a few more plants, a little more screening against this ugly wall, and then maybe we'll extend it that way eventually. Then we'll have to find a spot for my sleepy bony friend here back there, Trader Jim. And then one day, if all goes according to plan, after this is all awesome, back here, hut or whatever maybe not necessarily a hut this actually goes back very far it's an optical 
illusion. You could basically build a 9 by 12, I measured, hut thing back there. I wish I knew how to build a boat, you know, I'd build a big jungle cruise boat, but I would want to do all that and then have to move one day. Actually, people ask me that about the plants. What happens if you move? But the thing is, I know eventually I probably will move, but I have always wanted jungle garden. Tiki garden, if you want to call it that, but jungly adventure garden has been a bucket list dream of mine. And as you saw, just moving that stuff around literally took me all day, sun up to sundown, pretty much. And normally I would never, ever, ever have the time, but California is now supposed to be strictly locked back down again. And I had plans to go to Florida, I had plans to do a whole bunch of stuff, but I decided, you know what, we've come this far. I've been careful this far, and I've really tried to contribute and do my part this much this far. So, all right, as much as it pains me to sit still, I'm gonna try and whew, do my best to stay put. And the silver lining, if there is one, is that there's so much to do still here, putting stuff away, setting stuff up, and obviously doing stuff like that that I would normally never have time for that I guess now is the time so that hopefully in January when we're all re-released, I can hit the ground running and not have to worry about any of the stuff around here, if uh, that makes sense. So yeah, one last look, look at that. Tiki garden so far, or adventure garden or jungle garden, however you wanna put it. The random land jungle, awesome. And now I wanna show you something, but first let me take a shower a little quick cause that soiling was, was very dirty. I gotta be honest with you, I never thought that would take so long. All day I wanted to sit down, clear up some confusion, talk about something, share something new with you guys. And uh, I think I was a little anxious about it for some reason. So I just kept working out there all the way till the sun was down. But I'm now freshly showered. I got a nice, fresh, brand new random land shirt on. My new 3D embroidered cool new hat that I was excited about. Did get a little soiled along with the rest of me, but that's okay. For the most part, I'm clean, I'm fresh, and there's no more excuses. What I want to talk to you guys about is records, you know like sound records, record records. And uh, before I really tell you what I wanted to tell you, I've got to show you the coolest Christmas present ever. This was totally unexpected. This showed up at my house today. Look at this. This is the new LP. I believe it's a new LP from Buddy Guy. One of the last of the old time blues players, a blues legend. And check this out right here. It is signed. I noticed that Buddy Guy was doing like a limited number of signings, 2020, and I sent it to a friend of mine who's a big blues guy, and he's got some resources, let's put it that way, and I thought, it's a little out of my price range, but he should totally get, he's got to get one of these. So I told him, you know, I'll give him a heads up, and lo and behold, he bought one for me and sent it here as a Christmas present. Look at that, 2020 and everything. This is the last concert I saw before the big lockdowns in California, before everything pretty much shut down, we went to see Buddy Guy in concert. We almost saw Kiss and we thought, there's this weird virus going around, people are talking about it, there's a little bit of a buzz about that. Do we really wanna to go to the Staples Center? Nah, so we kinda of canceled that and then uh, we did still go see Buddy Guy though in this tiny place in Beverly Hills or somewhere and look at that. Buddy Guy autographed LP, it's a double LP, so look at this big old gatefold thing right there, but right on the cover. Buddy Guy 2020. And the thing that I wanted to tell you guys about, the new thing, I'm a little excited about it, also a little nervous to talk about this because I knew there would be a little confusion, I knew it was inevitable. I made a record, a brand new sort of record. That is right, my friends. A lot of you guys know already that my name is Justin Scarred because I was in a band called the Scarred, right? Right here. A lot of people think it's scared. It's not scared. We weren't afraid. Maybe we should have been. You will be. You will be. But it is, in fact, The Scarred. It's not my actual last name because of this, because there was a bunch of punk rock bands in Southern California with a bunch of different Justins for some reason. Like there was a Justin Havoc and there was a Justin from Guttermouth and then there was Justin Scarred. You know, we all kind of had our last names be our Band names, I was Justin Scarred Online, and when I started making these videos that I never thought in a million years anyone would ever see, why not just keep calling myself Justin Scarred? And so here I am, much to the chagrin, I'm sure, of my family that are not named Scarred. So, after eight long years, eight long years, this 
is in the universe. Because that's right, this is a brand new record, a brand spanking new record. But these are not brand spanking new songs. And that's where a bunch of the confusion comes up. So I wanted to explain why, just why in the world this exists. Now the reason is because this band started in 2000. Three, it was not my first band, not even the second band that I played and toured with, but it was the first band that was really mine, right? The Scarred. 2003, we, we recorded and self-released with the help of my dad, uh, our first album, Repression, one word, first album, in the year 2003. I believe there were only a thousand copies ever made on CD, and we sold those things everywhere. We would get out of the van on tour in the middle of nowhere and be like, hey, you wanna buy a CD, you wanna buy a CD? Until we sold out of a thousand of them. Then, because of that, we got signed by a pretty big punk rock label, a very indie DIY punk label called Punkcore Records, who unbeknownst to us had just signed a distribution deal with Universal Music. So, a uh, minor label with major label distribution. The record went everywhere. We were in Tower Records. We were in Best Buy. We were in Virgin Records. Remember those? Those were pretty good. And uh, that was really cool, except that happened just as the Great Recession began, just as the entire indie record uh, business certainly completely collapsed. All the distributors went away. The label went out of business. And because they didn't want to kind of admit to anybody that they'd gone really out of active business. People sort of just kept expecting us to put out another record with them. So by the time we finally were able to release that third record on that small indie label in Southern California, a record called At Half Mass, third album, three words, you see what we were doing there? Uh, nobody really remembered that we existed. They were so surprised. They thought we were going to come from over here. We came from over here. So that record was kind of weird. And it was pretty obvious we needed a major lineup change. And so we got a drummer who had toured with us in the band full time, which is my buddy Ben 9K. He's still out there making all kinds of records, like this Christmas record he just made with a surf band called The Volcanics. He's still drumming away all over the world. He drummed for all kinds of people. Resurrects, Jeffree Star, just crazy amounts of drumming. That's what he what he does. But anyway, by the time he was fully in the band all the time, we were finally able to get together and start making our last, what would turn out to be our last, full-length album called Live Fast, Die Poor. Fourth record, four words. See what's going on with the titles, people? It was the first record where we actually sounded like ourselves. The first record where I certainly sounded like what I always sounded like anyways, and where there weren't people in the band, and where, the, where there wasn't pressure from an outside label saying, well, this doesn't make sense. Sound more punk, try to sound more punk, especially you, you singer. Sing more punk, sing more mad, more punk, do it again and again until you're raspier. And uh, see, I'm getting anxiety just talking about it. It's just this weird part of my life that I don't, I don't poke the finger into that pie anymore, but um, it was the first time that I certainly sounded like me. I think it was our best record because there was no pressure to sound some kind of certain way. Um, but unfortunately, as ever, we used to jokingly, and I'm sure a lot of bands do this, but we used to jokingly say this was the most cursed band of all time because right when we got out the best record, finally the record we wanted, we had all kinds of problems with the guy who owned the label, not just with touring, but also with the way the record sounded because it got sent to a guy that didn't do mastering to master it. It's a whole complicated thing, but basically the long and the short of it was we got kind of um, heimbucked, if you will, and a whole tour got messed up with other bands and hundred, you know dozens and dozens of shows, and we took the blame for it, even though it was this label guy with this huge falling out and stuff. And so our fifth album, Never, never happened. I believe it would have been called The Anger and the Apathy. Oh, which is a line from this song right here, Kiss for Luck. So because the album was definitely not going to come out right away, and we were going, what in the world is going on? What's up? What's down? The scene was weird, and we didn't really fit in anywhere. We were too punk for the pop punk kids, and because of all these punk records that we'd done, and we were we were too pop. We'd always been too pop for the the real punks, as they called themselves. You know, um, we just really didn't fit in anywhere. Tyler Evans, rock journalist, always said that we were the band without a country. You know, <laughs> so um, what to do? What to do? We will put out a seven inch. And so in 2012, that's right, the year of the apocalypse, the end of the world year, we went into the studio and recorded these two songs, Kiss for Luck, which definitely would have been on 
the next record, especially because the title I wanted for the next record was right there in the song. Uh, and another one called Procrastinator, which I believe originally was known as the Smell Good Procrastinator, probably because there are a million commercials for the Smell Good Plumbers here in Southern California. I don't really remember why. My bass player started writing that one and he had never really gotten any songs that he had written out there in the world and he was kind of half writing it for me or something. So we're like, yeah, yeah let's put that on the seven. And so, Kiss for Luck and Procrastinator were recorded 2012 and then nothing. So many weird problems with that label. What the heck, do we own our album? Do we not own our album? We should own our album. Really a lot of bad blood, a big falling out. And then it just started to affect, everybody was just in these different stages of life. I would be divorced a year later, unbeknownst to me at the time, but there was all kinds of stuff. I had a kid, there was a disease that I was trying to figure out. And uh, Ben was on a career thing and Monkey was doing who knows what. It just, everybody was everywhere. And we never got to that record that we were gonna record. I, I don't even remember half the songs. There's no demos around of what would have been the fifth album. But we have these songs sitting there on the shelf that were clearly not coming out anywhere. And finally, in 2013, the band, I just couldn't do it anymore. There were a lot of reasons. I've gone through them in other videos, and maybe someday I'll, I'll talk more about it if you want. But uh, I, just, I just decided 10 years was enough. A nice solid 10 years was enough for me with the Scarred. It was time to move on to, I don't know what, I was gonna try to save my marriage. I didn't work out too well. I just try to do other different creative things, at least for my own sake, that did turn out to work out pretty well. So sometimes, by the way, people say, hold on to your dreams, hold on to your dreams. But sometimes you can hold on to a dream so long it becomes a living nightmare and you need to have new dreams and that's okay. But all the while, over all these years, man, I have thought, dang, it just was hanging over my head, you know, that. Jordan had recorded these songs. My friend Jordan recorded these songs, and he always liked these ones the best out of our stuff or stuff that he'd recorded, and I always felt bad that it never came out on vinyl like it was supposed to. And Monkey, of course, had written that one song, and yeah, or at least most of it, and it had never come out. You know, I felt, just felt so bad. And so all these years later, we had remixed and remastered Live Fast, Die Poor since we decided, you know, the one album that ever came out the way I at least kind of wanted it to, we wanted that to sound the way we wanted it to. So we got that on iTunes and we never touched it. And over all these years, it just built up just enough to pay for half of this. And because we were the most cursed band ever, the band the band that didn't fit in anywhere, the band where everything always went horribly, disastrously wrong for no reason. You know, the band that you tell people what actually happened, you'd go, dude, we were supposed to go on this tour or this or this or this and then this and this and this happened. And people would go, a likely story. I mean, Weird stuff happened, all the, as Ben put it the other day when I was bringing him this record. He goes, you know, people think our lives are crazy now, right? Ah, crazy adventures running around. But this was crazy. There were times where we were actually in danger of dying. This was a crazy life. Anyway, because it was the most cursed band ever, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if the most cursed band ever had their final recording finally come out eight years later in the most cursed year ever, 2020. And so we sent off everything that we needed to send off, the artwork and everything else. Artwork redone on the back, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, off to a pressing plant in the wild hope, the wild and crazy hope, because these things take a lot of time, that maybe, just maybe, it would be done by the end of this year. And lo and behold, uh, without any kind of warning, this showed up on my doorstep. The Scarred Kiss for Luck 7-inch 45 whatever you want to call it, after all these years. Look at that, the single, Kiss for Luck on Blue Vinyl. It is here. So everybody got 50 copies. I said 50 copies to the bass player, 50 copies to me, 50 copies to the drummer, 50 copies to the guy who recorded it, mostly in his house actually, for free. And um, then there were 300 or 250, something like that, a couple hundred copies on the online store and I threw them up without really explaining. I just posted an Instagram picture and I think I kind of maybe mentioned it in some video. I can't remember. And that caused all kinds of chaos and confusion. Firstly, more than half of them were sold, like right away, which I'm really great. Like, wow, thanks. Like, I didn't know that many people were interested in the world or maybe I should have made more. We only made enough that hopefully it would pay for itself and we get off scot-free with our 50 free copies to 
to uh, to hold on to, I guess now. The unfinished business finally complete. I'm sure after a while we'll all go like, let's just put those on eBay or something because what do you do with 50 copies of a record? I guess you give a lot to your mom on Christmas. Here's five, mom. Right? Remember? I'm so talented. See? Or I was 10 years ago or whatever. Anyway, um, so there's only a few uh, left, I believe, and uh, that's all well and good. But what I should have expected, what I had a little anxiety about, I was a little unsure about, but did not think through, was I probably should have said something beforehand because it has caused a little bit of confusion. And that is why I want to sit down, explain what this was, explain why it, explain why it happened, and uh, clear that up. So, number one, the main thing is, no, there will be no shows. After more than 15 years of playing live and going on tours and starving and living in vans and... Playing everything from, you know, House of, House of Blues shows sold out to uh, weird festivals in the middle of nowhere to literally uh, little rickety stages over creeks to a hallway in Alabama to backyards, abandoned houses, you name it. After playing shows everywhere, I've just, I did that. I did that for so long. It was very heartbreaking for me to put my heart and soul into a band for so many years that really didn't fit in anywhere. The people really didn't understand that at different times I didn't feel like some of the people that were in the band over the years didn't even understand and I just had had enough. Like I said, a um, number of years ago, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, right? So I, it was just time for me to move on, time for me to quit. It's not that I don't like music. I just really have no interest in ever playing a live show ever again. And so people have been bugging me now, especially musicians because it's really tough to be in a band and I feel for everybody who's still in a band and trying just to to get enough attention to put out records and do the thing that they love and try to book shows and everything it's and it's always been tough since social media came along and just blew the whole old way of doing things up um all mad respect to all my musician friends out there and everything it's just something that I am no longer interested in doing performing playing live there's also a whole long story, which I won't get into, about the fact that I cannot sing like that anymore. I had a range like this, which is now kind of like this. Like any muscle you don't use, it sort of wears out. And uh, on top of that, I had some nodes and some, some actual physical voice problems that I was already dealing with at the end of the band that made it like, I can't, I, I'm having a hard time getting through a whole show. There's no way now I could get through 45 minutes or an hour or two hours of playing live on stage and make it. There's just no way. So... That's the one thing. No, there will not be any new shows. No, the Scarred, the band, is not off of their apparently permanent hiatus. The, the band's not getting back together. Um, so that is also a thing. No, there won't be another new album coming out anytime soon that I'm aware of, maybe ever at all. I'm just, that was just a chapter that lasted 10 years and it was, it's done for me, I think. So never say never. I don't know. In five years, if I'm like, you know what I'd like to do? Discard. That'd be sick. I would do it. And so that's the sort of next thing that I was going to say, the next part of the confusion. Like, are you getting the band back together? Does this mean that you're going to make music all the time? I just feel like I should explain, particularly musicians ask this. They're like, dude, but if you put out a record now, tons of people would, would check it out. And if you played a show now, it'd be full, which is like every musician's dream. You know, people would come see you. I, I've just... I just don't have any interest in doing that. If I did and if I ever do, I certainly will do that thing. I will definitely put out music. I'll definitely let everybody know. I will, uh, if I ever play the show again, I'm, I'm, I would tell everybody you would hear about it right here first, I'm sure, but I just have no interest in doing it. So I think there's people out there who kind of think like, come on, man, don't be depressed, or they think that Maybe somehow because I've got some depressing stories about this band or, or, or because something in my past, I think maybe I gave up on my dream or something. But it's not that. It's that I did it. I lived the life of a, of a rocker. You know, I went on tour. I put out records. I played with big heroes of mine. I, I had, you know, posters in people's bedrooms and it was exciting and it was cool. I put out music. That was great, and it was all great. I have very fond memories, and I miss some of the people that I used to see all the time doing this that I don't get to see now, but that's just a chapter that, for now, I just feel like is closed. Now, I still make music sometimes. 
I still will occasionally write a song or think of a song or something like that. And if I was ever to put out any new music um, that wasn't just silly stuff for randomly, like I've recorded some silly fake 80s songs in GarageBand and, you know, stuff like that. If I ever was going to put something like that out, I would totally tell everybody and let everybody know. It's not because I, I have this thing of like, I just can't do it, guys, or, or anything like that. People are always trying to pep talk me about music. It's just I simply, I just don't have an interest in doing it right now. I, I know that sounds weird to some people. Like, what? The, but you did it for 15 years. Yeah, exactly. I did it for 15 years. And I'm just, I'm, my head is full of so many other projects and things that I would like to do. So if there's ever any new music, I will let you know. But I just wanted to, to uh, put that out there because that's been a lot of confusion over the last couple of days. I thought, cool, you know, the unfinished business. And I tried very carefully to explain like, hey, it's eight years old, but it's finally out. And, and it's out in the universe, the last piece of unfinished business with the last song, with the final farewell line. If you listen to it, you'll know what I'm saying. And uh, whoo, finally done with that, right? Door closed, chapter ended. As a matter of fact, the apartment we recorded this in called The Nest, um, or that we recorded some of it in anyway, uh, was this place where Ben and Jordan lived together forever. They made records and we would hang out there and all kinds of weird drifters coming in and out and crazy stuff going on. They Just the last guy that lived there just moved out this year. And so it's like the finale, the final record to come out of that place. It's like a nice chapter closing for everybody. And so I just wanted to clear it up and explain <laughs> exactly what it was because people are like, does this mean you're playing the show? Guys, it's 2020. I don't think anybody's playing shows, right? But speaking of shows, I was going to say on the back of this record here, these are photos by a gal named Jen Wrightley who uh, came to our final Orange County show anyway. Not technically our last show, but we call this, this is officially the last show. Um, that we ever played and it was one of those weird moments where I was standing on stage and um, I've written about this a lot which someday hopefully you guys will see that um, but I just felt like what am I doing here you know what am I doing up here so that was it that was the very very last show ever now if you'll notice right here people have been asking me about this too my drummer Ben 9000 is wearing a shirt with a pentagram on it oh are they in the Illuminati? Maybe. I'm not, but you never know with these guys, right? No, that's actually a 45 Grave shirt. That's a band. But uh, it was funny because he rocks in wearing this, right? It's a punk show. With all these punk rock bands. We're so punk. And they're all looking at him like, is he wearing like a metal shirt or something? What's up with the pentagram? And then he turns around and he has a My Little Pony <laughs> backpack on. That was Ben, dude. Ben... <laughs> That was us, actually, really. But Ben personified it in one person, this whole thing of like, whoa, crazy, and then, uh-huh, My Little Pony. And you just should have seen these guys confused, like, we're so punk, we're so proud of being so punk. <laughs> and then our drummer has got a My Little Pony backpack on and just how deflated they were. But that's the thing, you know? We were always interested in weird, funny stuff and doing different things and like, hey, that's cool, you're a brownie, or like, just whatever you want to do. And uh, we just felt a little, little, at least I did, a little stifled, a little like I'd just been repeating myself over and over and just stuck in a, a weird thing where maybe because of the labels we were on, maybe because of some of the bands I toured with, I don't know, but where people always thought we were a different type of band than we were or were always expecting us to be some serious, angry, weird thing that we weren't. You know, there's kind of the destroy punks in the world. Destroy everything, anarchy, ruin everything. And there's like the creative side of punk, like the DIY, do it yourself. No one will put out your record. Do what I just did. Put it out yourself. Make your own fan magazine. Make your own shows. And that was the appealing side of punk rock to me, was the taking control of your own destiny, making creative things, putting it out in the universe. Now, of course, we have the internet, and everybody's a punk rocker in that sense, right? So. So things have definitely changed in the world. But at that time, it felt very like, you have to look like this, sound like this, be like this. At least that's how I felt people perceived this band. And so we never really fit anywhere. It didn't really work the way we ever thought it would work. There were moments where it worked brilliantly and other moments where it just felt like it was going to collapse in on itself like a dying star. Anyway, I ranted about this for way too long, but I wanted to show this off because I, I think it's cool. It's definitely good. I like these songs. I really like these guys. I liked this band, um, and uh, I like this record. I think it's pretty cool, and it feels nice. Like, I finally went to prom. Actually, I never did go to my senior prom. 
So that's probably the next thing I've got to do. Maybe I should finish writing that 80s album and we'll have a Random Land prom, right? Random Land 80s prom, that'll be great. Not that my prom would have been in the 80s, but 80s proms are cooler than the 2001 prom that I would have had or 2000 prom, whatever it would have been. I don't know what was on the radio then, but it wasn't as cool as what was on the radio in the 80s. Probably. Just putting that out there. So, this is out in the universe. There are only, uh, there's a, maybe a hundred copies left somewhere in that neighborhood. And then that's it. They're gone and done. Someday, I think, uh, who knows how long, but the digital version will exist. So eventually, if you don't do vinyl, you're not into vinyl, you don't understand vinyl, you don't want it, you don't like the blue, whatever it may be, um, the song should be on iTunes at some point and uh, the digital version. Maybe we'll have a different color on the cover or something. Who knows? Um, but for the moment, it's just on this 7-inch, which is how it was always meant to come out. And it just feels good to finally have completed that thing. So, we're now in lockdowns. We're now stuck at home. Hear how weird and echoey and bad it sounds in here. And I apologize for this video. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. I'm not used to sitting down, sort of unedited, talking away about this stuff. And I, I don't know, for whatever reason, I feel like I get touchy about talking about music. I don't want to ever talk about it because I feel like people are always like, come on, man, why'd you quit? And I, I don't like that. I just don't like having to defend myself all the time about it because a lot of my musician friends were some for some reason offended that I didn't want to do this anymore. And so I, I don't know why I just get this weird anxious thing. So I appreciate you listening to me talk about it a little bit, open up about a little chapter of the life. And uh, it's pretty cool. So if you do like vinyl, there you go. I can't sign them because you can't pull this thing out. On most of them, it's so tight that even without the record in there, it is really hard to pull out. It would take so long. So everybody that did buy one, I put a little signed card in whoosh, into the package. So I did sign them, but I didn't sign on them because they're stuck in here. But if anybody wants to pull it out, send it in a self-addressed stamped envelope, if you know what that is, an S-A-S-E, look it up. Uh, I will gladly sign it and send it back to you. So um, there's that. That was the other thing everybody kept asking me. But there you go. The final record, the scarred. Maybe one day I'll put together a little video, a little more documentary style, more pictures and more stuff in it and tell you about this band. Or maybe I won't because it's over. And uh, yeah, and so is this video. Thank you guys very much for watching, hanging out. Like I said, lockdowns are... Supposed to be in effect right now. I'm trying to stick with it, folks. I got a rebellious punk rock part of me that's like, what? You can't tell me how to live and where to go, but I canceled my plans too, and I'm inside too, and we're trying to limit our contact and do all that stuff and really try to buckle down, try and get some of the stuff finished in the house. That's where I was going with the whole echoey thing. As you'll notice, it's very unfinished. Well, I have some non-echoey, take away the echo. I don't know where they went. Some tiles to put up and some things. So we're still working on it all. And uh, I guess I'll be back with something else weird from the house while we're in this refinement, confinement, confinement. I am clearly tired now. Too much gardening. It's time for me to go home and sleep well. So again, thank you all for watching, listening. Store.randomland.com if there's any of these bad boys left. Oh, or the new shirts. Or soon, the new 3D embroidered hats. Which are pretty sweet, or they were, until I dumped dirt all over myself. Thank you guys for watching. It's weird times for everybody, so it's weird times in Random Land too, And really weird blast from the past times for me. I feel like I went 88 miles per hour, went into the past, and now I've got to get back to the future. So, that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much again, and I'll see you guys later. go-kart champion he won this <laughs> go-kart race a pack of lawn tools and I'm reaping all the benefits you got the blues and then you got blue so you can choose <laughs> right or get both or get both he is a legend after all gotta love him don't need these stickers on here uh, do it the smart way bro it's hard to do things the smart way when you're a dumb dumb
This is a pain. I soiled myself. <laughs>